I've, I've wrestled all week cause, uh, about what the Lord wanted to say on Father's Day. And it wasn't really usually on the back of your uh, bulletin as an outline, but when I left here early Thursday morning with our, our young people and we went to uh, the Heart of the Father conference in Alabama, I really had not locked in on what I felt like the Lord wanted to say in this house today. And so it wasn't until yesterday, Friday in a, in a break that I found a Panera Bread, praise God for Panera Bread, and just locked in with my computer, tuned out noise, and just really went to studying and hearing from the Lord after already praying. And I, man, the, knowing that we were doing a pit boss competition, I really felt like the Lord dropped this in my spirit and my heart for this house this morning. And that is a real, real powerful uh, sermon title, but pit boss. And that, isn't, that authentic, isn't that authentic? That's genuine, right? Pit boss. And so that's what I want to speak to you tonight, this morning about, is being a pit boss. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to jump to another scripture that's not on the screen or not in the PowerPoint, but one that I just wanted to uh, read to us as well. But Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the what? Pit of destruction out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Now, for the verse of Scripture that's not on the screen, jump, jump over to Psalms chapter 103. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 103, beginning in verse 1. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not... All his benefits. Men and women, a lot of times we forget about the benefits that our Father gives to us. Amen. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, and here it is, underline it, who redeems your life from the what? The pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your amazing presence. Holy Ghost, thank you that you uh, visited us. You are here in our midst. I thank you, Lord, that you are inhabiting the praises of your people. And Lord, for the next few moments, I pray your anointing would just be upon your word. God, that you would speak, with us, speak to us, speak into us. Help us to hear it. Help us to apply it and to live it out loud and to live it out boldly. I pray, God, that your word would change us. And, Lord, we love you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many challenges and demands that are, that are, that, that are on people today. There's the challenges of life. There's the challenges of work. If you're married, you have the challenges of being married. If you're a father or a mother and you have children in the home, you have the challenges of being a father and a mother and raising up children. If, you're, or do, if you do anything, if you're in school, you have the challenges of school. You have the challenges of life. Anybody here this morning, at the sound of my voice, exempt from challenges? No one. We all face challenges. And oftentimes as we're facing with these challenges, we find ourselves in a pit. And this morning as, we're, as I want to share with you on pit boss, I want to look at the definition of a pit. The definition of a pit as defined by the dictionary says this, it is a hole, a shaft, or cavity that is in the ground, a mine a scooped out place using, used for burning something such as charcoal, and an area often sunken or depressed below the adjacent floor area, such as an enclosure in which animals are made to fight each other, a space at the front of a theater for the orchestra, an area in, in a securities or commodities exchange in which members trade, such as stocks. That is the dictionary's definition of a pit. 
But what is the Bible's dictionary of a pit? Well, Baker's uh, Dictionary of Theology says that it's in the Old Testament, it says that a pit denotes a large hole in the ground, and, it, and pits were used to catch wild animals. You read that in Ezekiel. Or it was used to collect drinking water like cisterns in Deuteronomy. Sometimes pits were used as dungeons or prisons like in Genesis and Exodus and Jeremiah. But very often, however, pit is used figuratively. For example, enemies seek to harm the psalmist by digging a pit for his life in Psalms 35. Commonly, it is a metaphor for Sheol. A a Sheol is a word that symbolizes hell or a a, a place of hell, and it, it means the grave. Since God did not reveal the hope of resurrection and the glory of glorious of heavens late in the Old Test until late in the Old Testament times, many expressions of the pit are quite negative. Everyone dies, so no one can avoid the pit. How many of you know that this morning there is a place that's called the pit of hell, and unless people are saved and they know Jesus and they're truly born again, they will not escape that pit. You want to be the, a true pit boss, escape the pit of hell. Amen. It's quiet this morning. You're, are you sleepy? Are you tired? Uh, I, I, I see that some this morning chose to go to Lakeside Assembly and listen to the bass preach this morning. Hello, amen. Nothing wrong with going to the lake, but let's not put off serving the Lord and being in the house of God. Amen? There is the, in the New Testament, the New Testament pit is used later and is also a figure for the spiritually blind Pharisees. It's also metaphorically used for an underworld, underworld, which is a dungeon, a gloomy prison for fallen angels. Second Peter talks about that. And in Revelations, it talks about a bottomless abyss for Satan during the millennium. So, how are we to be a pit boss in this place this morning? And understand something, ladies, this isn't just for men today. So if you think, well, great, I'm in, I'm in a service on Father's Day and he's only going to talk to men. No, how many of you know that God is no respecter of persons. Amen? And so he's talking to men, women, old and young, everybody. And so if, unless you are not have a heartbeat this morning, this is for you. Many people today find themselves in a pit with little to no hope of ever getting out. What kind of pits are they in? The pit of despair, the, the pit of destruction, the pit of depression, the pit of hopelessness, the pit of loneliness, the pit of fear the pit of addiction, the pit of pride, and the pit of failure. All of those pits people are dealing with, even in this house this morning. We find ourselves living and breathing and walking in a pit. But here's the only problem about living your life in a pit. In the pit, you cannot see anything, oh, you cannot see anything outside of the pit. All you see is what is around you, and that's not much. In this room right here this morning, although it is a sanctuary for the house of God, there are no windows. You cannot see out of this place. You can't see any harm coming. You can't see anything. That's why we have cameras. That's why we have security. But in this pit, in this building, you can't see outside. How many of you understand that the, the Bible says that where there is no vision, people perish? In the pit, you have no vision. In the pit, all you have is hopelessness, loneliness, despair, destruction, and you think this is all there is, and it's never going to be anything different. But the reason why a lot of men and women do not ever walk into the fullness that God's called them to walk into is all they see is the, what's surrounding them. All they see is the pit that they're living their life in. But God's come this morning to share with us that He's called you to come out of that pit. He's called you to be a pit boss. Like a boss, I'm coming up out of a pit. Amen? Am I the only one that's ever been in a pit? God's calling you. Some of us are so, so, so frustrated, so distracted. Some of us are fighting uh, financial struggles and we're just in a pit. But God's come to rescue us from the pit. He's come to make you a pit boss. Many men today, many, pe- many men, most men, have been taught to fake it till they make it. Most men... They put on their face. They put on their clothes. They got their regular routine every single day. I'm going to get up. I'm going to take my bath, my shower. I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to put on my deodorant because that's what daddy taught me to do. Our mama taught me to do. I'm going to shave. And I'm going to go to work. And I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve in that. I'm going to do what I need to do at work. And we just go through life. But deep inside, we're wrestling with something. Deep inside, we're struggling with something. 
and we find ourselves tripping over some things that we thought we had victory over. We find ourselves tripping over some things we thought we were set free from. And that's what happens when you continue to live your life in the pit. But we, and we've often quoted, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And all that makes us feel so good. All that makes us feel so happy in church. But when we walk out of church, when we're away from everybody else and we're right back into the, dr- uh, the trenches of life, we feel, oh my gosh, I'm right back in the pit again. Today, men and women often live in a secret pit. And we're good at putting on a mask. And going through the mundane, the same old, same old that others, ne- and so, th- and we do that, and never, others never really realize or fully understand what pit you're living in. Guys and ladies, I've come on this Father's Day to tell you that God says you are a pit boss. Amen? What is, and I don't know if you've ever, and the idea for Pit Boss for this competition we're doing today comes from a a TV show and people travel all over this country doing a Pit Boss competition. It's a barbecue Pit Boss competition. And and if you go looking for the right barbecue pit, there's Traeger, there's uh, all kinds of other names, and there's all kinds of great grills and smokers. And so for men to enter into a Pit Boss competition, there are some rules that they've got to follow. They've got to get their heat just right. They've got to get their meat selection seasoned just right. The ingredients have to be just right. The temperature on the grill, the atmosphere has to be just right as they enter this pit boss competition. Well, I need to tell you something this morning, men and women. The Lord says that you are seasoned just right because you are the salt of the earth. He says that you have the right stuff, the ingredients that He's placed inside of you because my Father in heaven knows how to give good and perfect gifts. Amen? I'm not looking for somebody else's seasoning. He's already seasoned me with what He wants me to be seasoned with. He's already placed within me the gifts that He's called me to carry and walk in. I don't have to have your gifts, although your gifts are important for the body of Christ. Your gifts don't concern my gifts. My ingredients that He's placed in me are the ingredients He's placed for me. Amen. And I am the salt of the earth. He also says that even though it may seem like you can't stand the heat... More than you can stand the heat. You, you may feel like it's too hot and you can't stand the heat, but guess what? Fire, when you're around fire, things get purified in the fire, amen? So you may be feeling the fire in the pit right now, but in that pit season that you might be in, understand that when God begins to purify something, the impurities come to the top. The impurities come to, and like refiner's fire, he takes off those impurities. Just like in Jeremiah 18, when he molds and he shapes that clump of clay, oh, there's a little speck, oh, there's a little bit of dirt. He takes it out and he starts all over again. How many of you glad that God never gives up on us? Amen? Because you are a pit boss. God says that He's given you the proper tools, men and women. He's given you the proper tools to be the pit boss. So there's two points I want to make this morning. Two. Oh, pastor, you said, last time you said two, you preached for an hour. I don't know how long we're going to preach. I never determined that. Amen. That's up to Him. I'll shut up when He says shut up. Is that okay with you? Amen. Good. Because if it wasn't, too bad. <laughs> But the first thing we're going to look at this morning as it pertains to being a pit boss is, number one, life in the pit. Down in the pits. If Satan can get you to feel like your life is worthless, you will never accomplish God's purpose in your life. This past Wednesday, I spoke about haterade. How people are so, people always hating on you and they're trying to rob you of your purpose. Don't drink what haters are serving up to you. Amen. Don't drink the hater aid. It's better to drink the power aid. The, the, and I know we got a Pepsi guy, and it's not even about Pepsi or Coke. But you got to drink what the Lord is giving. He said, drink of me and you'll never thirst again. The pit, your view, your vision is blocked in the pit. All you can see is what is, it in, what is in the pit. Can any of you see? Look around. Everybody look around the room. Can you see what's on Highway 171 out there? Can you see? What's going on in the kitchen over here? Can you see what's going on in the nursery or in the children's church? Can you see what's going on? No, you can't see anything that's outside of this room. 
And so when we're in the pit, our vision is blurred because, and we wonder why we're never getting anywhere. We feel like we're a hamster within a wheel, spinning our wheels, going nowhere fast. And we feel like nobody cares about us because they don't understand the season that we're in. They don't understand the pit life that we're living in. You know what? Sometimes people don't understand because they're in their own pit. They can't reach. They don't see you in your pit because they're in their own pit. All you see is what's in the pit. Some people in this room, you feel so low, so down, so frustrated, so defeated. You feel like the pit is all there is for your life. Well, I got to understand something. I was, I, I've, I've shared my testimony and I'll share even more. But there was, and I've shared with you how I was afraid to marry my wife because all I ever saw in the pit was abuse and divorce. I never saw Even though it had been prophesied over me, even though three different men that didn't know each other from Adam, Robbie Mitchell was one of them, that laid hands on me and prophesied over my life, prophesied over ministry. I heard that noise, I heard those words, and it felt good when it was said to me, but when the music stopped and the preaching was over and I walked back into my living my life, all I found was in the pit. It, well, I was in the pit, and I couldn't see. How are you? Who are you to tell me I'm going to be a pastor? Who are you to tell me thousands will come to Christ? Who are you to tell me that people will get healed? Who are you to tell me that I'll see miracle signs and wonders? You, that's great, and that sounded good in church, but I'm right here in this stinking pit, and I'm scared to death to marry my wife. I had no vision, because you can't have vision if all you see is what's surrounding you. You know what the definition of vision is? Seeing above and beyond the horizon. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles, right? And it looks like, it may look like, and this is what frustrates me about Vernon Parish. Oh, we don't want to grow. We're satisfied with our little pit. Churches closing and dying left and right. Because they're just satisfied with us for no more. Oh, don't change nothing. Don't change nothing, pastor. Don't change nothing, church leader. Don't sing a new song. Don't do nothing. Because we're satisfied with this pit life. Not never knowing what so much more, how much more is out there for us. Amen? Let me ask you a question this morning. Is there anybody here that you're, you can say you're completely satisfied with all that God's already given you? Or do you believe that there's more for you? Is there more, or are you just completely satisfied? I'm done. I'm checked out. Thank you, Jesus. Just take me out of here. I'm done. There's so much more, but it's beyond the pit. Amen? Can I tell you something this morning? Your marriage is not defined by your mama and your daddies. Your life is not defined by how your parents lived. Your life is not defined by your mistakes. Your life is not defined by your failures. Your life is defined because you were created in His image. And He said, it's time to come up out of that pit. He brought you out of that miry clay. He put your feet on a rock. And He's done that so He could build your life. Men and women come in and they say, well, Father, I've prayed, I've asked you to help me, but I'm still in this pit. Well, let me under- let's understand something. There's two, two types of people in this world, two, 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 over seven billion people, but they all fall into two categories. You're either a builder or a destroyer. Amen. There is power in your tongue. What's coming out of your mouth? What are you speaking into existence? What are you declaring? There's some things that you need to understand about the pit. While you're in the pit, the pit of despair and feeling like nobody cares, the old hee-haw song, uh, agony and despair, woe me, or all that, how that goes. It's been so long since I saw hee-haw, but you know what I mean. Doom and despair and agony on me. Yeah, whatever. There's some lessons if, you, if you're in the pit and you are living, you've experienced the pit life and you continue to go back to the pit, you're continuing to go back to the pit probably because you've not learned your lessons in the pit. One thing you need to understand is that regardless of how you got into the pit, there are some valuable lessons learned in the pit. On the barbecue pit boss show, These men and women 
travel all over the United States. And for the record, I'm not bashing our state. I love Louisiana. But it's just not known for good barbecue. Hello. Am I the only one that bears witness? Give me some Cajun food, hallelujah. But it's just not known for some good barbecue. Kind of iffy on the chili too. Hello. <laughs> Let me get off the food. But on the show, the pit boss, barbecue pit boss, they travel all over the country. And they're given the rules, like Sister Naima printed up rules for the men that entered today. And they're, they're given these rules. And they have to follow these rules to a T. And so these men and women, they get up that morning thinking, you know what? Okay, I've marinated my meat just right. The, I, I'm winning this competition. They're following the rules. They've done everything they needed to do. They, they've cooked that brisket for 12 hours, not 8. They've cooked it for 12 on a low heat, on a low hickory smoke heat. Or they've cooked uh, their uh, uh, pork roast or they've cooked the, whatever it is that they're cooking. And they've done it. And they followed all the steps. They followed the steps to the T. Only to allow the anticipation of winning to build up on the inside. But then there can only be one winner, right? In a competition. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're not in a competition. But in the competition, here they are knowing, you know what, I've just prepared the best brisket ever known to mankind. My own mouth is watering. I can just smell it coming. I know I'm about to win. And then they present their meat, their presentation, the presentation to the judges. Only to hear the judge say, sir, or ma'am, while your meat looks good, while your meat tastes really good, we feel like you are not the pit boss champion because we feel like you could improve in some areas. Now, at that moment, that pit boss has a choice. He can do like most Christians who don't get their way and stomp away. I'm never going back to that church. I'm never going to an altar again. I've prayed and I've asked God and He doesn't do what I'm asking Him to do. I'm not going and entering another pit boss competition because that judge said my meat stinks. I didn't do it right. Or you can learn some lessons in the pit. As iron sharpens iron. So another man sharpens another man's countenance, right? As iron sharpens iron. Okay, what? tell me how I can improve. Tell me how, I, come on, in today's society, everybody is afraid of accountability. In today's society, everybody's afraid of someone sharpening them. If someone's a little sharper than you are, we want to get away from them because, oh, it hurts. Oh, it, it cuts. Just recently, I was told I was mean when I preach. I'm not mean. I'm not, the, I'm not mean at all. I love people, but I love people enough to tell them the truth you think I'm mean in my preaching, go, 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 go to a sugar house or a candy factory. I'd rather tell you the truth and get you, and to get you out of the grips of hell than to give you a bunch of candy bars and sugar and get, keep you right in the hands of hell. Amen? So you have two choices. You can either give in to the negativity that the judge just told you, or you can say, you know what, I, there's some room for improvement. Is there anybody other than me here this morning that has some room to grow? Because I, I, I like what Paul said. Although Paul had done a lot of things, Paul had already been doing ministry work. Paul was already missed as a missionary. Paul was do, already been in prison. Paul made this statement that was so powerful to me. He said, not that I have yet arrived, but I press on. I press on. In other words, I learned some lessons in the shipwrecks. I learned some lessons in the beatings. I learned some lessons in the prison. I learned some lessons when they kicked me out of the cities to, after preaching. I learned some lessons, and I'm still standing. Amen? Because a pit boss is only a winner if he or she keeps getting up. Keeps getting up. Life in the pit stinks. Now, understand something. In this pit, and I'm going to get to the point two in a minute. That's where it's really going to get good. I know this may sound a little gross. And my wife is going to, see, I already told her. I already, I already gave her the prelude to it. I already told her what was going to happen. But I sweat a lot. Anybody else sweat a lot? 
Yeah. I wear an undershirt because, of, because I sweat a lot. I wear undershirts on purpose. I know that might be TMI for some of y'all, but just letting you know about my wardrobe, okay? Praise God, it went from 3X to extra large. Hallelujah. But even though, even though I've lost a lot of weight since March, I still sweat. And my wife despises washing my undershirts. You know why? Because of pit stains. Come on, that's gross, isn't it? Those pit stains are yellow. They get crusty. It's nasty. And she can put bleach. She can get all kinds of new tide. She can do all she can want to do for that t-shirt. But after a little bit of time, that t-shirt needs to be thrown away. Because the pit stains are just gross. Now, guess what? You don't know whether or not this t-shirt I have on underneath this shirt is stained or not. You do not know that because I've done a good job of covering it up. Let that sink in for a minute. We do a great job of covering up the stains in our life. We do a great job of covering up the yellow. We do a good job of covering up the, the, the crustiness. We do a good job of covering up the, the stain of sin, the stain of hurt. We do a good job of covering up the stain of life because of what we have put on over. And look, the, we, we're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs. We have the appearance that everything is good. But deep down inside, we've been stained by life. We've been stained by the issues of life. And it doesn't matter what you do. You can go to every church, over a hundred churches in Vernon Parish. You can go to every one of them, but until you deal with the stains in your life, you're not clean. But guess what he does? He doesn't play with the computer and hear that little noise. That's why he doesn't do that. But guess what he does? He takes off the robes of filthiness and gives you a fresh, clean robe of righteousness. One that you're not to hide under a bushel. One that you're to let all men see before God. Let your light shine. Amen? That's life in the pit. You know what washes the pit stains? Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood. Come on, sing. Of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. Amen. How many of you are glad for the, for the stain removal called the blood of Jesus? Amen. The stain removal of the blood of Jesus. Now, there's some examples in the Bible of people, and if you can, I want you to study chapter 40 of Psalms, because this talks, David is in Psalms 40, it talks about a pit, the pit life of David. I want to ask you to go back and study it, because it falls into two sections. The first half, David tells how God got him out of one pit, and then he sings God's praise for doing so, but then in the second half, he's in another pit, and he's crying out to the Lord for him to deliver him, and because David waited intently on the Lord, to rescue him from the first pit, he knew how to respond in the second pit. So it's a psalm about what to do when you're in the pit. And uh, friends, understand this. When you're in the pit, you got to wait intently on the Lord and proclaim his goodness when he, when he answers. Now, let me talk about some pit boss champs in the Bible. Pit boss champs in the Bible. These were overcomers. Guys who overcame the pit life. They, uh, Sister Naima, they were the pit boss champs in the Bible. And, and I wish I had a great amount of time to accurately give you the exegetical breakdown of all the people in the Bible who overcame the pits of life and, and, have, and were overcomers, but time does not permit for me to talk about every single Bible character in the Bible for us to accurately describe how they came out of the pit, but I do want to talk about a few. Amen? And we're going to look at the Old Testament first, then we're going to jump to the New Testament, and for those of you taking medicine, it is 1144. I want to tell you about the first mention of a man who overcame a pit. And it's found in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 37 to be exact. His name is Joseph. Look at verses, verse 19 and 20. Genesis 37, 19 and 20. 
They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the what? Pits. Then, he, then we will say, a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Woo! I told the church on Wednesday night to be careful who you share your dreams with. Be careful who you share your favor with. Be careful who you share what God's told you to do with. Amen? Because not everybody's for you. And so here's Joseph. God gives him a dream. And Joseph's so excited and in his youth and in his exuberance and in his excitement. Hey, hey guys, guess what, guys? You're going to bow and serve me. You're going to bow, and, and fall. You're gonna bow uh, at my feet one day. Now, my sister is 18 months younger than me. And if I was to ever tell her, Jody, one day you're going to bow at my feet, my sister would slap the snot out of me. She'd slap me so hard my grandpa would feel it. And he's been dead for a long time. I'm serious. You talk about sibling rival right here. Joseph has it. But what happens? He's put into the pit. Pulled out. Sold into slavery. Gets into, gets into the, uh, a mansion. Gets accused of rape. How many of you have ever been accused of something that you've never even done? You were just there. Right place. Wrong time, wrong person. But God, I didn't do it. And nowhere in Scripture do you ever see Joseph putting a fist in God's face and saying, I didn't do it. Nowhere do you ever see Joseph complaining to God about his pit life. After he's accused of rape, thrown into the pit of prison, right? I love, if you read on a few more chapters and get into what, chapter 52, 54, somewhere in there, there's a phrase in that scripture in that, that says something about Joseph's whole life. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph, even in the pit. He's in the pit. He has some, there, there's some dreams going on. He interprets some dreams. Tells him, hey, when you get out, would you speak on my behalf of that, I, that I interpreted this dream? They forget about what, God, what, they, what Joseph did for them while they were in prison. So he's still stuck in the pit. If anybody ever had a reason or an excuse to blame God for his circumstances, Joseph did, but he did not. Because Joseph knew that the Lord was with him even in the pit. Even when men and women forgot about him. Even And because Joseph stayed true to who he was, he stayed true to the Lord God himself. Uh, Joseph was a pit boss in the pit. There's another Old Testament God that you don't hear much about. In fact, he's only mentioned a few times in the Bible. Uh, next one, please. His name is Benaiah. Benaiah. In 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 22, it says, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two heroes of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when snow had fallen. Anybody ever stood on snow? Anybody ever had a fight on snow? You don't have a sure foundation. You have, when it's snowing outside, when it's icy, you have to walk a little careful. You have to be careful because you might slip. And I've fallen on ice many, many times. And I've slipped on the snow. I've scooped more snow. I loved living in Louisiana because whenever we packed up, I sold my snowblower and I said no more to the snow shovel, no more to the snowblower. My back has not hurt since I got here in 2013. Hallelujah. But Benaiah is one of those cool background characters that's only mentioned a few times in the Bible. And whenever he shows up, he's doing something incredible. Benaiah was David's chief bodyguard. And sometimes you got to chase your problem into the pit and defeat it and then come out victorious. Don't just think that just because your problem left for a little bit that it's not coming back. Because once you've gotten victory over something, those spirits will leave and they'll go out into the desert places, the dry places. But then they're going to come back. Then they're going to see if you've made any actual changes. Or was that just an emotional experience on a Sunday morning? Did you really get victory in the pit? No. Whenever something leaves my life, I'm chasing that dude. I'm going to kill it. You know what? I'm putting my foot on its neck. I'm cutting its head off. David didn't just kill Goliath. He took Goliath's sword, stood on his face, and cut his head off. That's how you get ahead in life. You chase down your enemy even though you've already defeated it. Amen? And so Benaiah... 
understands that this, not only did he just kill two men, he went into a pit on a snowy day and he killed a lion. Sometimes you have to fight the fight alone in the pit, but other times you need somebody to help you. Now, I wish I had time to tell you about those two men. Wish I had time to tell you that if you studied their names, Ariel of Moab, the two sons of Ariel of Moab, their names meant lion like men. So not only did Benaiah kill a lion in a pit on a snowy day, he killed two men that were lion like. Come on, God's, called, God's trying to raise up some lion killers. Because in 1 Peter chapter 5, it tells us to be careful, to be aware, to be sober, to be, vil- be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And everybody wants to run away. Oh, the devil's after me. Oh, the devil's after me. No, you need to rise up in faith. And like that old southern gospel song, when you rise up in faith, the devil will be in the phone booth dialing 911. Amen? Because can't nobody do me like Jesus. Then I want to tell you about a man named Elijah. Anybody ever heard of Elijah? In 1 Kings chapter 19, there's this wicked, wicked woman. Her her name happens to be Jezebel. And this is right on the 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 shirt tail of a great victory that Elijah just experienced. But right after Elijah experienced this victory, there's this awful, evil woman. And that spirit's still alive today, but she's not, that spirit's not welcome here. Hallelujah. And she sets out to kill Elijah. And the Bible says in, in 1 Kings chapter, Chapter 19. Here's this man who just saw God do a great victory. This prophet, this mighty man of God, pastor, prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, it says in verse 3, Then he was afraid, his knees were shaken, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. You know, you're pretty scared when you're leaving somebody that's there to help you. Amen. His feet didn't even touch the water. He probably ran right across that creek. He's so scared. Leaves who's there to help him. If you go on and read a little further, Elijah is so down and out. He's so depressed. He's such in that deep, deep depression, that deep, deep pit, that he's, so, he's in a place of disparity. And he asks the Lord in his despair and in his depression, why don't you just kill me? Elijah's contemplating suicide. But the Lord sends him some food. I love this. Tells him to arise and eat. Then he says in verse 9, look at verse 9. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, Elijah, just who do you think you are? Get up and get out. He, understand, God didn't show up. God sent His Word. I got excited last night as I was cooking my meat on the barbecue grill. I was re- going over my message, and I remembered in the, in the book of Exodus when it said, I sent my Word and I healed their diseases. Amen? And so there, the d- depression, <coughs> oppression, disparity, all this frustration, all these distractions, God sent His Word to heal your diseases. Not that you, you know what? Jesus is here this morning. Amen? And is Jesus the Word? And so if the Word is in the house, healing is in the house. If the Word's in the house, victory's in the house. If the Word's in the house, breakthrough's in the house. You don't have to live in that pit anymore. So Elijah gets up and he gets out and he gets back to work. Some of us have been crippled by fear. We've been crippled by all kinds of stuff. What are you doing in that pit of despair, Elijah? Get up and get out. Then there's another guy in the Old Testament. I love this guy. His name's Daniel. Anybody ever heard of Daniel? Daniel chapter 6. Daniel is thrown into a hungry den of lions. Daniel's just doing what God's told him to do. Daniel's just going about his business. Daniel's just doing and trying to live his life pleasing to, to the God the Father. But then there's this king named Jarius, King Jarius. And the story of Daniel and the lion's den teaches us about the promises and the faithfulness of God, even if we feel like everything has been lost. And so Darius makes the, some other men get jealous of Daniel, and they, they come up with this, this weird, they come up with these charges against Daniel, and they tell the king Jarius to make this rule, make this declaration. And, and so and Darius was a ruler over Babylon, and, he, and those, these men 
were helping govern and lead. And so Daniel, the leader of advisors, was a man who believed in God and he followed the Lord fully in all of his commands. These men didn't like Daniel. And so they told King Darius to make a new law in which people could worship and pray to only the king. And if they worshiped or prayed to other gods, they would be thrown into the den of lions. Now, Daniel knew who he was in God. Daniel, there was no confusion about Daniel, even though Daniel's name was changed. Come on, some of y'all have allowed the enemy to change your name. You, got, you need to know who you are. Are you going to be defined by that pit? Daniel honored, he was an honorable man. He honored King Jerry's. Never spoke ill of him, but he would not bow and worship him. And so it doesn't matter how good of a man Daniel was. doesn't matter how awesome he was. doesn't matter that he was advising people and he was leading people. It doesn't matter. King Jarius had to honor his decree. And so he had to get Daniel. He had to put Daniel into that den of lions, that pit. But understand something. Even if you are surrounded by hungry lions, even if you're surrounded by gnashing teeth that are trying to take you out, the Bible says in Psalms that God has come to shatter the teeth of the enemy. Which means all those things that have latched hold of you, all those things that have tried to take you out, you're in that pit of the lion. Understand that God shows up in the pit of that lion, and that pit, that let lion turned into a little kitten. And he's in there purring. And when they come back and they look in and they see Daniel in there, Daniel's petting that kitty. Oh, such a good kitty. Such a good, good kitty. That's my God, amen? Then there's a, another, the other ones in the Old Testament uh, that right here in the same book, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their names were changed too. They were given those Babylonian names. And here they are. There's another decree. Now Nebuchadnezzar. Build a big statue and tell everybody they're going to fall in worship. And those that don't are going to get thrown into the furnace. You know the story. And so if you know the story, you know that even though these men refuse to bow, these men refuse to fall and worship a false god or a false idol, you know that if you know the story, you know they were thrown into that furnace and it was so hot, seven times hotter than anything else. You know that the only people that died were the soldiers that were looking in at them. And you also know that when Nebuchadnezzar stuck his head in, oh, wait a minute, I thought we only put three in the pit. Who's that fourth person in that pit of fire with them? Because, my friends, if I'm going to tell you right now, if you will continue to worship and praise God in the pit, God's going to bring you out of the pit. Amen? You are not surrounded or defined by what's going on in the pit. Let your praises come out regardless of what you're facing. Now, that's Old Testament. New Testament. I'm almost done. I told you I only had two points. We're on point two. And I can't talk about everybody in the New Testament because I'd be here all day. And I want to eat some ribs and some pork roast. But there's a man named Lazarus. He's a good, good friend of Jesus. They come to him, Master, your friend Lazarus is dead. Come quickly. He's sick. He's going to die. Come quickly. And Jesus is still Making s'mores, beans and franks, roasting hot dogs with his boys, his disciples. He doesn't go when they wanted him to. Come on, we've got to stop thinking that God's going to move when we want him to move. We've got to stop thinking he's going to act when we want him to act. Listen, we can put demands on heaven, but listen, his ways are not our ways, declares the Lord. He makes all things beautiful in his time. So he waits till the fourth day. You know why he waited till the fourth day? When we were in Israel, our guide taught us this. And by the way, if you want to go to Israel, you better get you, some. Many of y'all signed up, and we we stuck. We we stepped out and told them we were taking a group. There's only eight people signed up. If you are still contemplating going, you got to the end of the month to get a deposit in. After that, the deposits are over little infomercial. But our guide taught us that the reason Jesus waited till the fourth day was, was because on the third day, they, were, they had this belief that the body could still come back to life. And that it wasn't really dead. So Lazarus, wait, Jesus waited until the fourth day to prove a point. That he really was dead. 
And, la- and Jesus wanted everyone to see his glory. They want his, wanted his father to get the glory of resurrection life. So Lazarus is thrown into the pit. He's dead. He stinks. Four days. No embalming fluid. He stinks. Wrapped up in grave clothes. You know the story. Jesus shows up. They're in despair. They're crying. They have gotten themselves into a frenzy. They've gotten themselves into a pit of despair and upset. They're mad at Jesus. Well, if you have only come sooner. But how many of you know that if Jesus speaks to your pit, you're coming out? Amen? If he speaks to your deadness, you're you're coming alive. You're coming out, and then not only does he speak into that pit of death, he calls, that, he calls that man out of that pit, and now he's still surrounded by the things that the people put on him, which were grave clothes. And then he says, get those grave clothes off of him. They don't belong on him because that's not who he is. That's not what I've defined him as. Amen? Then I would like to tell you about another man who was thrown in a pit. His name happens to be Jesus. He was born in vir- as a virgin in Luke chapter 2. And then he, he walked this earth as a man. He lived as a man. He had every op- function as a man. He was not gender confused. He knew who he was. Amen? You know where he was born? He was born in a pit. It wasn't this cute little manger, this nice little barn, with nice little wood and trough. No. If you go to Israel with us, you're going to see. They still have it like, they still have homes over there like that. An actual pit underneath the house. That's what Jesus was born in. And when you see the trough, you're like, oh, wow, that's not like what we've seen in the manger scenes. Jesus was birthed in a pit. But was he defined by it? No, I believe he was birthed and born in a pit so that you could get out of your pit. Because there is nothing in your life that you can say that Jesus never experienced. During his, during his life, as he's going to the cross, he was died, he crucified, buried, placed into another pit. Right? Isn't that awesome? Jesus is the ultimate pit boss. He was born in a pit, was buried in a borrowed pit. While he was being buried in that pit, he went down to the pit of Sheol. He went down to hell. He's like, oh, while I'm here, I'm here in this pit. You're not coming out, but I come to take back something that you took. I come back to destroy you. I've come back to take the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And then he came out of that pit. He rose victoriously so that you and I could have access to the keys of the kingdom. And then he's coming back again to rescue out of this pit called the earth. Soon and soon, soon and very soon. A couple more. Can I go on? Two guys. Acts 16. I'm not reading these scriptures. You write them down. Acts chapter 16. It tells us about two men. Here they are doing the, the work of God. Here they are doing everything that they're supposed to be doing for the Lord, Bobby. Their names are Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas gets arrested. They get put in prison. They get, they get, they get their lives just wrecked. They're put into prison, and do you understand the prison that they were placed in was not like the prisons like we have today. If you read and understand Scripture and you dissect and you exegize this Scripture, you will understand that the prison they were put in was the inner prison. Not the prison, they were put in the inner prison, which was a deep pit. No, no toiletries, no bathroom, no, no, hands, no, no sinks, nothing like that. And they were shackled. And in that, while they were in that pit, they could have been blaming their circumstances. They could have been blaming the situations. They could have been saying, God, I was preaching your word. God, I was doing this and this and this for you, but here I am in this pit. Instead, they were singing, Waymaker, Miracle Worker. They were singing, Break Every Chain. They were singing, Can't Nobody Do Me Like Jesus. They were singing, praises to the most high God in the pit and it looked like they were surrounded by defeat but that was not they understood that they fought their battles they understood that praise was a weapon worship was warfare they understood that and in that pit the earthquake happened in that pit the the doors begin to open in that pit the chains begin to come off and in that pit they came out victoriously listen you might be in a pit But you got to declare today in the name of Jesus that, baby, I'm coming out of that pit. I'm going to be a pit boss because there ain't no pit going to shut up my praise. Then I'm going to tell you about two more men. Real quick. 
There's another man in the book of Acts. <clears throat> in fact, Acts chapter 7. His name is Stephen. Again, he's found honorable. He's found living right, living holy, pleasing to the Lord. Jesus, I'm so done with feeding into everybody's negativity. I'm so done with the naysayers and, the, and what's being said. Stone somebody if you want to. You without sin cast the first stone. Here's Stephen preaching. Here's Stephen living the life. Here's Stephen being bold. Here's Stephen walking in the authority of the God who created him. Here's Stephen full of the power of the Holy Spirit. So much so they, they hated him for it. And they are stoning him. They're beating him. They're killing him. And the whole time that he's dying, the whole time he's there and he's on his knees and they're stoning him, throwing rocks at him and accusations and all this, hurling all this stuff. The Bible says that Stephen's countenance was so full and glowing that the Holy Spirit was all over him. Stephen died in peace even though he was experiencing pain physically. Why do we allow the pain of this world to impact the heart that God sent Jesus to, to dwell in? Can't touch this. Amen? Can't touch this. I'm covered in the blood. Satan, you can do this and you can do that. Everybody can say all they want and do all they want. They can make accusations. They can say this. They can say that. But I know who I am. And you, look, I, my eyes have got to be lifted up because that's where my help comes from. I've got to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And, it may, and Stephen was a perfect example. Here he is in the pit of death. People killing him for doing what Jesus told him to do. People destroying his life because he was being faithful. A martyr for Christ. Pit boss right there. Lastly, there was a man in chap Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to close. Worship team can come. Matthew chapter 5, we see a man who was possessed with many, many demons. He was in the catacombs. Those tombs, whatever. Christina and I got to visit that place. What's interesting is this man has so many demons. When Jesus came in contact with him, he asked him, who, who are you? And the man responded, the demons responded, says, I am legion, which means many. Not just one, many, 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 multiple. This man was cutting himself. This man was, had lived in these catacombs for years, possessed by all these demons, living in a pit. What I found interesting, Friday... Is how comfortable the people were that lived around there. I don't know about you, but if I had a neighbor that was that possessed, I'd be I'd be going over there doing an exorcism. But they were afraid. They, they nobody had that that kind of faith. Jesus shows up, speaks to that demon or those demons. The man is set free in the name of Jesus. The demons leave, go into a herd of pigs. Understand something, because it's of kosher rules, there is no pork in Israel. Isn't it interesting that there just happened to be a pig farmer there? There's no pork in Israel. Kosher, right? When we were there, we had to eat falafel. We had to eat some other weird food, Mediterranean foods. No pork. I, I craved bacon. But it went into the pigs, and the pigs jumped off the cliff and drowned in the sea. Was, but that, and then when Jesus goes to get into the boat with his disciples, get ready right here, because here's the first missionary that Jesus calls. When this demoniac who got set free, brought out of that pit of demonic warfare, when Jesus and his disciples go to get in that boat, This set free man from all these demons go to get in the boat too. And Jesus said, no, you're not going with us. I want you to go back and tell 
everybody what the Lord's done for you. Just moments before, he was a demoniac in a pit, surrounded and influenced by probably hundreds of demons. Legion. Brother Bill, he didn't go to Sunday school. He didn't have time to get baptized. He didn't have time to meet everybody's standards of what a missionary looked like or a pastor looked like. He didn't meet the approval of all that. He was just cutting himself not long ago. And how Jesus tells him, you've been called out of darkness and brought into this marvelous light. You have been rescued from the pit. Now, friend, you're not going to go with us. I need you to go back and tell others. And I close with this, friends. Whether you're in a pit this morning or you've come out of a pit, you have not been called out of a pit for you to sit still and keep your mouth shut. Well, that's not my job. That's somebody else. Oh, no. The word G-O, go into all the world and preach the gospel, that's not just for people to stand behind the pulpit. That word G-O means you. It means me. And many people are not going. Many people are not preaching. Many people are not telling the story. Because you've come out of a pit. You want to get out of your depression? Tell somebody what God's done for you. You want to feel better about yourself? Lead somebody to Christ. Get a burden for the lost. When's the last time you cried over this region? When's the last time you cried over Vernon Parish? Or have we all just settled with the fact, well, it's the Bible Belt. It's Louisiana. Everybody's a believer. Bull. No, they're not. From the time we started this service to this moment in time, do you know how many hundreds of people have died and went to an eternity of hell this morning? I'm going to ask you this question. Ask yourself this question. Do, do I care that people die and go to hell on my watch? If he was not willing that any should perish, if he was not willing that any should spend eternity in that great, great pit of the abyss, Sheol, that great pit of hell, if he's not willing that anyone would spend eternity there, and if we are to be like him, isn't it high time we come up out of our pit of self-pity, our pit of despair, and be about our Father's business? Amen? Isn't it about time that men, fathers, men, whether you're a father or not, understand, all of us in this room, here's something we're all called to do. We're all called to do this. We are called to raise up spiritual sons and daughters. I've got a a 17-year-old that will be a senior, and we've been talking about when he leaves the house. But oh my gosh, other than just our two boys that we've birthed in the natural, we have so many other people that we look to, that look to us for guidance, that look to us. And they're our spiritual kids, sons and daughters. God's called you to raise up spiritual sons and daughters. You can't do that if you're stuck in the pit. If you have a pit story in this house this morning, I ask you to stand to your feet. If you have a pit story, God called you out of a pit. Come on, there's one, there's one truthful person. You've been called out of a pit? If you're in a pit this morning, God wants to get you out of it. I look around in this room and I know there's been pit of, uh, there's been pit of alcoholism, pit of addiction, pit of divorce. There's, been, there's people in this room, your life's been so involved in the pit that people look at you and say, oh, that's just so pitiful. Seriously, it's pitiful.